It's good. Thank you. What a pleasure it is to be here. Second Kwahi conference ever. My name is Cynthia Hammond. And one of the core themes of my paper is the importance of acknowledging collaborators. So I'd like to begin by thanking two people whose research has helped me enormously with this paper, Marissa Nee, who did primary research for me at the University of Guelph Archives, and Thomas Strickland, who shared his own primary research on McMaster University in Hamilton with me. I owe these people a lot for their assistance and their insight. My paper will present a brief history of the landscape architecture firm Dunnington, Grubb and Stenson, active in Canada between 1911 and 2009. I will highlight a few of this firm's many designs for private gardens, public parks and civic spaces, and use one member's own writing to frame the firm's contributions to and philosophy about landscape. Two women and two men were the core members of the firm, a situation which permits me to explore some feminist research challenges for historians of the architectural professions. And the sunken gardens of the Royal Botanical Gardens in Hamilton, shown here, will be my concluding case study, by which I hope to show how landscape architecture history takes us directly to questions of site, context, and use. These important questions invite, if not demand, more broadly inclusive histories of space, as well as open up histories of gender and collaboration in a country where landscape and land are at the heart of both artistic traditions and nationalist discourses. Dunnington Grubb and later Dunnington Grubb and Stenson operated primarily in eastern Canada for nearly a century. The firm was founded by English-born landscape architect Laurie Alfreda Dunnington with her husband Howard Burlington Grubb. Choosing to hyphenate their names, the couple emigrated to Canada in the year of their marriage, 1911. This was also the year they launched their joint practice in Toronto. Both were great advocates of Beaux-Arts planning, the City Beautiful movement, and Art Nouveau. Their arabesque design for Gage Park in Hamilton, seen left, is an example of these principles in action. Trained in the English garden tradition, the couple soon found their design needs could not be met by available planting stock. So they also founded a nursery in Oakville where they cultivated such native trees as the pyramidal cedar, seen right. They also imported species from outside Canada, such as Japanese plants, which they especially admired. The firm would come to recommend, in writing and design, Japanese cherry, plum, and maple trees, as well as Japanese quince and iris. To nurture such plants in the harsh Ontario climate, they hired Swedish-born nurseryman Sven Herben Stenson in 1914 to run Sheridan Nurseries, a name I'm sure many of you have heard, a company that thrives to this day. During the interwar years, the firm built their reputation on their designs for large private estates and public parks. Lori Alfreda Dunnington Grubb published and lectured extensively, promoting the firm's designs, philosophy, and horticultural knowledge to a broad audience. Her numerous articles for Canadian Homes and Gardens and Canadian Home Journal were often illustrated with drawings or photographs of the firm's work, such as you see here. This article, The Value of Water as a Garden Feature, champions thoughtful design choices. And Dunnington Grubb often adopts a somewhat regretful voice of experience to motivate her readers towards better choices. Quote, to place the work of a noted sculptor in the middle of a park with no better backing than a group of deciduous trees, trees is to commit an unforgivable crime. Yet, alas, I have seen it done. End quote. And with such rhetoric, designer becomes advocate in these pages, fighting the effects of developers whose techniques of clear cutting and stripping building sites of precious topsoil are frequent topics. In many articles, such as The Artist in the Rock Garden, Dunnington Grubb uses the language of art and pictorial beauty to lay out her belief that landscape architecture is, quote, the connecting link between the art of man and that of nature. Nature, she explains, provided the canvas and the artist seized upon it. Thus, many a lovely picture can be created. 
In framing her design philosophy in such terms, Dunnington Grubb made a case for landscape design as the sister art to architecture, equally necessary to the cultural needs of a rapidly urbanizing country. These publications were not the only means by which the young firm raised the profile of their profession. In 1934, the Dunnington Grubbs were founding members of the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects, for which both Lori Alfreda and Howard Dunnington Grubb served as president before the start of World War II. Over the years, the firm would grow to include members of the Stenson family, notably Bill Stenson, son of the man who worked in the nursery, who collaborated on such well-known projects as University Avenue in Toronto, seen here, and on the expansion of, of Sheridan Nurseries. Landscape architecture prospered in the post-World War II years, and the firm had plenty of work, more than I can show you. But Bill Stenson's marriage also led to the expansion of the firm. His wife, Janina Korkuk, a, a Polish landscape architect and garden historian, became a principal member in 1960. Janina Stenson was the last surviving member of Dunnington, Grubb and Stenson, and I don't have time to discuss her work today, but I will say that when the planners of Expo 67 invited the firm to design landscapes for Ile saint hélène and Ile Notre-Dame, Cork Extenson's <coughs> colleagues handed the commission to her in deference to her extensive experience with landscape reconstruction and modernist design in the Soviet Union. In total, the firm produced numerous publications, plans, reports. They were leaders in their profession and designed more than 300 landscapes and gardens in Canada over 98 years. Innovators in multiple ways, Dunnington, Grubb, and Stenson have yet to receive the scholarly attention they deserve. There is a book coming out by one of the descendants of Bill Stenson. You can pre-order it on Amazon, but it's not out yet, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I can still say. I don't know yet how much scholarly attention Dunnington and Grubb get, but uh, Stenson, the Stenson family will definitely be there. And I'm still in the early stages of my research on this firm, but I suspect the reasons for this neglect are complex. Some certainly have to do with gender. In Elizabeth Birmingham's study of American architect Marion Mahoney Griffin, Birmingham explores a vast literature that erroneously attributes Mahoney Griffin's designs to her more famous male collaborators, such as Frank Lloyd Wright. The house we see on the screen is still attributed to Frank Lloyd Wright, even though Mahoney Griffin's name is on all the construction drawings. This same literature intensifies the misattribution by consistently spelling Mahoney Griffin's name wrong, providing misinformation about her birth and death dates and other important life details. Birmingham notes, quote, while spelling errors may be trivial and accidental, such scholarship makes the work of other architectural historians harder to do, end quote. Similarly, with Dunnington, Grubb, and Stenson, I have found the names of all firm members to be variously misspelt, it's all those consonants, I guess, in both popular and archival sources, but the names of the female designers suffer this problem far more frequently and are often missing altogether, despite the fact that their names appear clearly on sketches, construction drawings, and final documents submitted to the city. Yet when the firm is mentioned in secondary sources, it is always with great reverence for Howard Dunnington Grubb, who was frequently honored as the father of landscape architecture in Canada. We see one such instance on the screen with regard to the Oaks Garden Theatre landscape in Niagara. Perhaps this insistence upon a singular male progenitor of these meticulously ordered floral landscapes serves discursively to reinvest them with a masculinity in a culture and profession that remain dismissive of the connotatively feminine. Architectural historian Thaisa Wei notes the double bind that female landscape architects face working in a realm that is always already associated with the feminine and domesticity, gardens. Women landscape, architects, archi sorry, women landscape architects have an additional battle to gain recognition within the field of architecture more broadly. Their specialization is often dismissed as a sort of decorative surplus to the central economy of architecture. 
Here, for example, the traces of a formal private garden designed by Dunnington Grubb can still be discerned in what is today a low-income housing estate on the edge of Lake Ontario, which was built up around the garden much later. With its symmetry, geometry, paths for strolling and central sculptural feature, this garden embodies many of the qualities that Laurie Alfreda Dunnington Grubb espoused in her published writing. And despite the loss of variety in plant species, this garden is a rare survivor of the firm's early practice. It was also, and those of you who know me will know how much this means to me, the locus for suffrage activities during the First World War, and so belongs to the history of women and space in a number of ways. Activists are, however, presently fighting to save what you see before you, as the city has plans to demolish this garden and the surrounding apartment blocks to make way for high-priced condominiums. Garden as decorative surplus, un indeed. Dunnington, Grubb, and Stenson thus constitute a largely unknown landscape design dynasty. Remarkable as the firm's success was, it nonetheless poses several problems for the writing of a new history of women and art in Canada. At Dunnington, Grubb, and Stenson, the female designers' lives and work were completely intertwined with the lives and work of the men they married, hired, and supervised. I've already discussed the tendency for scholars to assume that women's work in architecture was done by male collaborators. But in this case, a recovery operation means recovering shared creative work, not examples of women's work alone. Although examining writing by firm members will, I believe, help me to attribute specific ideals to specific individuals. But comparing published statements to realized designs is, however, difficult with excuse me, difficult with landscape architecture, where final products have far more transient and fragile futures than buildings. The image you see on the screen, a very small fraction of the vast Shadowbrook estate in North York, shows one of the firm's largest commissions ever. Today the site is much reduced and a convalescent hospital, bearing almost no trace of the elaborate Japanese-style gardens designed in 1929. I'm pretty sure the bagpipers have gone too. <laughs> In the remaining moments of my presentation, I would like to return to the question of how landscape architecture, despite these various challenges, also offers opportunities that are directly relevant to the question of what a new feminist history of Canadian art could look like. You see here again the image I used to open my presentation. On the left are the beautiful sunken gardens in Hamilton. Designed by Dunnington Grubb in 1929, the gardens were, according to Deborah Ecker, large and formal, their main feature a concrete reflecting pool with steps, lily pads, and many varieties of plants. Within 35 years of its creation, this idyllic landscape was destroyed to make way for the McMaster University Health Center, or MUHC, to your right. Designers of the MUHC took advantage of the landscaping to set a parking bay and entrance pavilion deeply into the ground. This loss is certainly something to lament, and maybe something to get very angry about if you don't like brutalism. But it's important not only to acknowledge the sunken gardens that preceded the MUHC, but I would argue also to seek information about the landscape that preceded the sunken gardens themselves. What had been there before? Originally the home of the Atanwandaran and later Six Nations, the land at the western termination of Lake Ontario was settled by United Empire loyalists in the 18th century. In the early 19th century, English entrepreneurs saw the value of this lakeside site, but the town developed slowly until the Industrial Revolution claimed the south shore of the bay, reshaping the landscape to meet production needs. By the early 1900s, the city was, like many urban centers in Canada, only partially regulated and suffering all the usual problems of intensive industry. After 1918, moral and urban reformers began to eye up an enormous site encompassing the entire western termination of Lake Ontario. Seeing this landscape as an ideal locus for the exercise of city beautiful planning ideals and the creation of a new visually appealing arrival to the city. 
The red circle on screen shows the location of the future sunken gardens, which were to be one of two key entry points to the Royal Botanical Gardens, whose scope is indicated by the green oval. The lakeshore was, however, already occupied. The water's edge was home to a community of more than 100 families and individuals who composed comprised sorry, a well-established squatter's settlement, some who had been in residence for more than two decades. The community had built their own homes out of scrap materials, some houses quite elaborate structures on stilt, stilts designed to prevent water damage and provide the best views of surrounding waters. But the residents also created a social and cultural landscape around their use of Burlington Bay to the east and Coote's Paradise, a marshland, to the west. The waters of each were appealing to the boathouse residents in terms of recreational activities, such as swimming and boating, but were also crucial to their survival, as hunting and fishing provided significant sources of food in difficult financial times. One key feature of the community was its diversity. The boathouse settlement of Burlington Bay and Coote's Paradise provided holiday space for a few financially secure city dwellers, but for the many working class families and unemployed individuals, a boathouse in this community was their only home, as suggested by the tin shack at Wright. And perhaps the lack of regulation in the boathouse community allowed forms of diversity that would have been less welcome elsewhere. A mason named Stanley Bennett is noted in primary sources as an African-Canadian resident of the community, whereas the majority in the official city of Hamilton was white. In the late 20s, as Nancy Boutier and Ken Cruikshank explain, quote, a coalition of town planners, nature conservationists, and moral reformers sought to raise the boathouse colony. They wanted to eliminate what they saw as a physically and morally dangerous place and replace it with a carefully regulated, aesthetically pleasing, morally clean park." End quote. A major competition in 1928 determined the future face of this part of Hamilton. Luminaries in Canadian art and architectural history, such as John Lyle, already mentioned, Carl Borgstrom, and of course, the Dunnington Grubbs, contributed designs. A massive landscape overhaul was approved, which included, included the eviction of the boathouse community, demolition of their homes, outlawing of fishing and hunting, and the reconfiguration of their land. Accordingly, the, the city was made newly visible as a site for middle-class leisure via the landscape design tropes of rock gardens, flower beds, arboreta, and protected marshlands. These, collectively, would open in the early 1930s as the Royal Botanical Gardens, with the Sunken Gardens by Dunnington Grubb as the formal entry to the southwestern side of a purged, aside landscape of civic pride. Thus, the Sunken Gardens can be read as a keystone gesture within the move to substantially reimagine Hamilton. The strategic cultivation and reorganization of nature that we see in these landscape designs is profoundly connected to the fate of the boathouse community, its cultural landscapes, its social diversity. What I hope the example of the Sunken Garden suggests is that the history of landscape architecture offers a powerful resource for feminist art and architectural historians thinking about creative project production in the context of Canada. First, this history has a largely untapped reserve of female creatives, such as Laurie Alfreda Dunnington Grubb and Janina Crockett Stenson, both worthy of many conference papers of their own. But their designs were always intended for a specific place, whether this was someone's backyard or a major vista in an upwardly mobile city. And it is that specificity of place that I want to put before you as the key methodological offering that landscape architecture gives us. It is only by thinking critically about space and place that we can begin to work against what Kim Dovey calls the complicitous silence of architecture, its spatialization of oppression and empowerment, privilege and resistance. And it is in this work that historians of landscapes can attend not only to the structurally uneven place of women in histories of art, 
but also to the deeply politicized narratives of power and agency in a given site. If making gardens is an essential part of a nation's culture, wrote landscape architect Harvey Humphrey Carver in 1975 in his memoirs, then Canada owes a lot to the Dunnington Grubs, which he spelt wrong, not only because they designed and built gardens, but because it was from their Sheridan nurseries that suburban populations first learned to carry home triumphant blue spruces, Fitzer's junipers, and Chinese elms to make a garden out of the desert they had bought from their speculative builder." End quote. A new feminist history of Canadian art would consider the importance of its debt to designers such as Laurie Alfreda Dunnington Grubb, Howard Dunnington Grubb, Bill Stenson, and Janina Corcook Stenson. But it would also ask where exactly those junipers and elms ended up, and about the history of the land on which those exquisite new species found their home. Thank you. <laughs>